Frontline Workers Alliance has about 1,300 members at the moment. A union of small farmers affiliated to La Via Campesina. So La Via Campesina is an international organisation of peasant and agricultural workers unions. It's active in 81 countries and has about 200 million members in total. Farm workers protests in India are driven by La Via Campesina affiliates. You have the landless workers movement in Brazil, which is about 7 million strong. Its underlying political philosophy is food sovereignty, that it should be the producers and consumers of food who ultimately control how that food is produced and distributed. The Land Workers Alliance are really spearheading this. And then we've got Kiondo, who are based in Birmingham, we've got the Rewild Project, who are based quite locally, Local Equality Commission, which is an anti-rural racism organisation based in Gloucestershire, which is fantastic. Landon on Ames, who are in London, and I think there's about nine organisations in total. Over the next three years, we'll be running events like this of varying scales and really trying to get people talking about land justice and food justice. And what's really great about this fair is that there are so many people who are able to bring a skill and sharing those skills. It's been wonderful to see different ways of people doing things and it merges us all together as a people. And we're eating really good food that's organic, nutrient dense and having a good time. It was so great. Coming to the countryside for the first time, like this is my first time camping, my first time being out in a place like this and experiencing what an event a farming event even is. We started growing out of nowhere really, so this is our first dive into it and it's been really, really good. Thinking about access to land for black people and black farmers, I mean, traditionally we've been dispossessed of land, um, like, like lots of people in, in Britain, but also from the countries where we have heritage, have been kicked off the land, ancestors who were colonised, enslaved. When you think about how colonial rule happened in Africa, farming again was very much a punitive thing, like you know, you were, you were, you were forced to farm. So I think there's still a lot of trauma in terms of like how we actually connect to the land and how we feel. My granddad was a farmer and he sent his daughter, who's my mother, here to the UK to get better, better education. But I feel like even growing up, it was never, considering her dad was a farmer, she would have never accepted me being a farmer. In this country, studies suggest that racial attacks are a lot higher in rural spaces. People can experience a lot of hostility trying to go onto the land. Even being in the countryside, like the idea of like the landed yeah. gentry, like when you think about historically how that money was made, that's yeah, a very yeah, alienating yeah, yeah, feeling yeah, yeah, and feeling is. like there is trauma in the place that there's the same place that where this wealth and where this land abides. Knowing all of those things kind of then plant to seed in our in our mind where it's like maybe this isn't for you maybe this maybe the countryside maybe the greenery is not for you um, especially growing up in a, in a city as well this country needs a lot more farmers a lot more people who are growing food we deserve to feel a sense of belonging in this country um, and that's to the land and rural spaces too and just because we exist mostly in inner city areas doesn't mean that we always have to in Land in Our Names we use a reparatory justice framework and it's thinking about reparations in terms of repair. Repair of a harm that was done to people and to the land. Reparations, transferring land back to communities who've been dispossessed of land worldwide will include land being handed over from wealthy landowners here to uh, communities, people of colour. Uh, from inner city areas. We got interested in growing and then we kind of hit this big brick wall when we realised how hard it is to find land in the UK. It seemed completely inaccessible. So it's been really kind of empowering being here and hearing the strategies that people are taking to actually make land accessible to us. Yeah. I feel like we can find land now. I feel like we yeah. can grow if we want to yeah. just know yeah. that opportunity is available. It's a big impact, I think. Big, yeah. Yeah. Flame stands for... 
Food, land, agriculture, a movement for equality. We're a youth group promoting three principal aims, which are... Food for all, promoting agroecology, and youth involvement in land work. People should have access to good, healthy food all the time, and youth have a part to play in how that comes around. A lot of people in our generation deal with climate anxiety and really struggle to know where to put their energy. Yeah. And this is actually building a community of like-minded people where you, know, you can learn about opportunities to get onto the land and actually be part of a regenerative project. Um, working on the land as a young person, especially if you're queer or a person of colour, it can be really alienating. So it's really important for us to have um, this group so that we can all create a network. Even though I come from the southwest, where it's, everything is farm work, um, not a lot of people know how food is actually grown, the processes involved in land work, um, in food production, where food comes from. With Flame, we're trying to educate more young people just so that they can have an understanding of what our food system looks like and also the flaws in that and then how we can fix it. You don't have to be working on the land as a full-time job. You can be a volunteer, you can be working in a community garden. We don't want to do just like activism stuff. We want to also be like, are we learnt new ways to do some land work stuff as yeah. well or like I've come up with this new recipe or like you know yeah. just other stuff as well that is just fun to share. We've just been offering free tea and coffee and hot and chocolate. People just come in and have a little chat to us. And if they're young enough or will enough <laughs> become a part of the group and community. Oh, 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 oh how they ruin things are green May Project Gardens it is a hub that reconnects people to nature for personal, social and economic transformation. It basically takes place in my council house um, and it's basically using permaculture design with a very much a focus on people care. When I first came across permaculture, it was very much focused on the land. Then when I started applying that to people care, I was like, nature has all the answers. Permaculture starts with this notion of the problem is the solution. So often people say, oh, I can't work with this community. The lack of engagement is not the issue, it's just the approach. We use the principle of value in the edges and value in the margin. Where you see two microsystems or ecosystems meeting, that's where you have the most diversity, the most innovation, the most creativity in nature. So if this can work for nature, then this application can work for people. Valuing people in the edges of society. And we work with those people. We create a safe space for them to feel empowered and to feel safe through nature, and it creates a transformation. I'm Scott, I'm with the Rewild Project. We're a local community <laughs> enterprise in the Forest of Dean, where we do traditional handicrafts, community growing spaces, social forestry. We do a lot of education with a CALS course, Craft and Land Skills. So we've come here to show different aspects of that, mostly craft. We had a deer which was skinned and butchered and now we're going to eat and feast. And then we've got a pit forge for blacksmithing. And we've also got some clay, pottery, and then the, we're going to fire that in a, in a pit fire to see how the clay goes. So yeah, we're in full swing. Humans have been engaged with seed since millennia. So we've been naturally seed savers. But what's happened now is we've had this sort of coalescence where we have four companies that control 60% of the conventional seed market. And in some crops, that's up to 80%. And all of these companies began as chemical or pharmaceutical companies. Companies like Monsanto declare that they have created new life. So therefore, they have property rights to that life seeds are patented and we don't have the right to save them or share them. They're suggesting that it's higher yields and it's absolutely not. They are tying farmers into having to buy seed year on year and then they also buy the chemicals produced by those companies. The UK imports up to 80% of its seed so we have to upskill growers in the UK. We work with small scale organic and agroecological growers who are primarily growing and saving and sharing what are called open pollinated seeds. So a lot of what we do is like building friendship and solidarity networks to work with each other to say we already have this knowledge. We work with communities in sub-Saharan Africa. Primarily the seed keepers there are women and the elders within those communities. Through globalisation and colonialism those communities have been told 
your seed is inferior, your indigenous ways are backward, you need to buy our seed and you need to adopt western systems of farming and this has caused catastrophe. A quarter of a million farmers in India have committed suicide because of the problems of getting into debt around this false promise of their seed and in African countries you're looking at issues around drought, water shortages, the inconsistencies around climate change, their indigenous seed varieties are resilient, are strong, are locally adapted. We need these seeds to be in the fields and then we need to save and grow on these seeds and begin rebreeding new varieties of seed because we have lost so much. Fansborn Food Banks started in 2015 in Liverpool. It was a real simple concept. It was asking every football fan to come to the stadium and bring a tin of food, which would then go into food banks, which unfortunately exist, even though they shouldn't. That spread across the country. And then when I entered Parliament, we had an opportunity to call for political change. And that's where the Right to Food campaign started, when we knew the National Food Strategy was reporting back, and we firmly believed that the Right to Food should have been included in the National Food Strategy. We know 60% of people using food banks are actually in work. With over 10 million people in food poverty, 4.7 million children in poverty, and that's what the Right to Food is here to address. We want systemic and legislationally change. Universal free school meal and breakfasts, a benefit payment or a national minimum wage agreement enough to meet a healthy, nutritious diet. The ability to access community kitchens, so say within a school, let's open up all the facilities we've got in our community. The schools have a lot of land that they don't really know what to do with. An organisation called Grow in Barnet, they're based on the land of Totteridge Academy. So they don't pay any rent for that land and in exchange they teach the kids. And everything that the kids grow goes into the school dinners. Kids from the school can learn how to become a grower for their CSA scheme, which they sell to the parents. The government have got to come back in the next nine months with a white paper and we want to put a bite of food in that white paper. There's so much interest in this now. There's the ability to build a real, real powerful movement. Come over here. On the grass? Yeah, on the grass. My name is Culture Lee. I was raised in Gloucester. My parents come here in 1958 from Jamaica. My father come on the Windrush. He was a poor farmer. In Gloucester, where I come from, we converted these spaces four metres by five metres, creating togetherness, community, garden project for people in the inner city community. A lot of them live in flats and don't have no space, a social space for us as blacks. The clubs are gone, are gathering spaces. I am based at Pario Youth Club and I run my own garden there, which is called the Lion's Den. 35 children I had every Monday to the after school club and it's gardening, art, cooking, leisure and sport. The gardening was wonderful because when we first started it, two wonderful stories. We took the carrots out of the ground and children said, culture! I thought carrots came out of a tin. And that's what even inspired me on. And then we have this girl called Alexis. She's only about five. And she said, culture, can you tell me what that is? And I had 30 odd children behind me. Children, tell her what that is. It's rhubarb. Have you never had rhubarb crumble before? But then when the mother come to pick her up, then I understood because she was a young mum, 16, 17 because I couldn't understand how they didn't even know what Rebar Crumble was. So it was so liberating for me to know there's a lot of work to be done. We put in a bid for some funding to help us look at the conditions of agricultural workers in Britain. How do we organise with these workers? And also reaching out to the organisations that are just kind of happening naturally. Farms in Scotland taking part in the new seasonal workers pilots where you get workers in Belarus and Ukraine, they come over for six months and then as soon as their contract ends they have to be deported back. Despite the you know very, very precarious situation those workers are in, workers who are coming back for a second time are often form informal representation systems on certain farms. People who are negotiating with the farmers on behalf of the rest of the work. One of the examples that inspires me is the Coalition for Mikali Workers, a group of about 15,000 Mexican migrant workers based in Florida. They were the worst paid workers in that sector in the country. They started taking strike action. They reached out to supporters groups, often in universities, and started to put pressure on the large corporations that controlled the whole supply chain to sign an agreement known as the Third Food Programme. They pay an extra penny for the produce that they get, which then funds wage increases for the workers at the bottom. But at the same time, you have a worker-driven monitoring process. It gives workers a way to actually control their conditions. So that's really what I'd really like to see happen in this country.
workers and allies have been stationed at Delhi city borders for nearly nine months now. They're protesting against agricultural privatisation that will end up benefiting a few billionaires. At least 78% of India's farmers are actually small farmers and they're endangered of being wiped out in the face of this corporate competition. This wouldn't be so alarming if agriculture was not the source of livelihood for 58% of India's population. That's 792 million people. Farmers in Punjab, but other parts of India as well, started a protest in their own states back in August, September last year. And then in November, they said, right, Delhi Jallo, which means let's go to Delhi. Since then, there have been thousands slept out on the streets, on the borders of Delhi. They've been barricaded off, so they're not allowed into the city. They've had their electricity cut off, their water access, their toilet access, access to internet. They've established community kitchens, so they're actually feeding the people of Delhi now. There's a lot of poverty. They've established medical camps, doctors that are free voluntarily, libraries, schools for young people and elderly that want to learn how to read and write, art events, movie nights, music nights. So so actually they've shown Modi how to run a country. Every single day, women have been going to the parliament in Delhi and running their own parliament outside of it, saying, your parliament's not democratic, this is our parliament. 250 million people in India stood in solidarity on the 26th of November, 2020. On the 26th of January, there was a huge clash between police and the protesters. Elderly people beaten with batons, tear gas and water cannons. With all they have at stake, they've proclaimed they would rather die than give up. So over 550 farmers and laborers have already died on the front line in Delhi. We have been sleeping out every month. It's in conjunction with a team in Vienna, San Jose, California, Seattle in Washington, Toronto and Vancouver. As long as our elders are out there, we're going to be out there too. And the next big one is in November because that's when it will be one year since the protest in Delhi started.